Uh, I'm going to do a somewhat formal talk. Um, so I hope you'll be patient with that. Uh, but before I do it, just I, th I thought to say just a couple of things in terms of how, how massive the transformation of the world is at the moment. And, uh, and I, I will say that I, I sort of mourn uh, that there's so little discussion about it here in the United States and so little preparation for what's coming for, uh, for future generations. Um, I was in a discussion the other day uh, online uh, with, with people from kind of movement leaders and scholars from uh, across Asia, uh, including a woman a scholar from Hong Kong who's somewhat associated with the, with the uh, Chinese government. Uh, and as we were talking, she was uh, explaining, you know, most of us think that when President Lula of Brazil went to uh, China, all he was talking about was Ukraine and the possibility of a ceasefire uh, and, um, and peace negotiations. Uh, but as she explained, in fact, um, Brazil has a $60 billion debt to the United States. Uh, 10 billion of that coming due. Uh, and uh, the, the, the former dictator, Bolsonaro, basically left the treasury without any money. Uh, so Brazil was facing bankruptcy. Uh, the Chinese had a solution for that. Um, uh, they could, they have lots of treasury bonds. Uh, they could pay off the $10 billion that are coming up for payment now. And in exchange, Brazil uh, could um, uh, send them both resources uh, and products. Uh, and the, the, the financial dimension of this would take place uh, in, in yuan, the Chinese, chem uh, Chinese currency. Uh, and as she said, you know, the Argentines are following this model as well. Uh, so it's a way in which we can see part of the transformation here uh, of the reduction of U.S. hegemony uh, and the um, uh, rise of Chinese uh, influence in a non-military way. Uh, I was in another conversation um, with uh, actually a former Iranian foreign minister who was describing the, the, the significance of the Iran-Saudi uh, deal uh, that the Chinese have uh, recently pulled off. Uh, and uh, among other things, he was saying that uh, he had a list of the various wars and coups uh, in, in the Middle East under the period of U.S. hegemony of the last 75 years, uh, and then contrasted that uh, with China's policy, which has not chosen size among the various um, countries and forces there, uh, and whose investment uh, and, and, and trade uh, with the Middle East um, now exceeds that of the United States, uh, explaining that you know, the U.S. is no longer the major player in terms of major powers. Uh, in, in, in the Middle East. And then a man named Trita Parsi, who is the uh, number two man at the Quincy Institute in Washington, uh, was basically saying that you know, with the U.S. essentially military first uh, dimension of its, of its foreign policies, uh, the United States has been playing in the wrong arena. Uh, the United States is losing influence because we've been so focused on the military and less focused on the needs of the countries uh, in which we um, have relations. Uh, so I, I just put those forward to kind of underline the, the, the huge transformation that the world is going in. Uh, and, and, you know, I have kids and grandkids. Uh, and, you know, with, with the, with the, with the um, I have no love for the Saudis, uh, but you know, with the Chinese deal, uh, we're going to have more of the oil traded in yuan than in dollars, at least from Saudi Arabia. The petrodollars uh, from the oil trade, you know, used to come into Chase Manhattan Bank and into the U.S. economy, and we're going to have fewer of those dollars uh, boosting the American economy as trade is increasingly in, in yuan. Uh, we don't really have discussion in our society about the implications of this and what we need to do to, to offset and prepare for the future. So I thought just a couple of, of stories to, to say that. Uh, but I'm going to get more serious now. If that didn't, that didn't shake you up a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go a little bit deeper. Um, it's, it's only a little bit after 4 o'clock, I guess going on 5 o'clock. Uh, but Bob Dylan is saying that the hour is getting late. Uh, and uh, in that watchtower light, uh, let me begin with two hard truths. Let me make sure this thing is working here. Hold on a second. Yeah. Um, 
As Professor William Appleman Williams, once the Dean of American Historians, uh, wrote, uh, the authors of the U.S. Constitution envisioned their project as empire building. They drew on the models of the Greek, Roman, and 18th century European empires in writing the Constitution. Among their debates were how concentrated the metropolitan center should be and what the demographics of the electorate should be in order to ensure that the ruling elite maintained its power. By the end of the 19th century, with genocide, slavery, wars, and settlement the Continental Empire was built and consolidated. And with the Spanish-American War, the U.S. launched its overseas imperial project, described as, quote, the greater United States, by the really fine and young historian uh, Daniel Imawar in his book, How to Hide an Empire. I was amazed in his book where he describes the uh, influence of the angle of the uh, threads of a screw uh, and how who controls uh, the, 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 the global um, uh, criteria for what that angle should be uh, has massive increased economic power and influence. Then, you know, to fight World Wars I and II, a military industrial university complex was created. The president and former General Eisenhower understood the inherent dangers of the complex, warning that its subversive tentacles would undermine democracy and lead to imperial wars. Not that his administration's CIA coup in, coups in Iran and Guatemala or his repeated threats and preparations to initiate nuclear war should be celebrated. But 60 years on from Eisenhower's warnings about military spending being, quote, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, uh, those who are cold and not clothed, close quote, the inherent dangers of the military-industrial complex uh, are such that we now have military production facilities and military bases in every state of the Union. Members of Congress are dependent on military industry contributions. Uh, they fear losing military contracts and their dollars and jobs to their communities. It's no accident that W. and Jeb Bush are the fourth generation of their armaments-related family. And as the saying has it, when you are a hammer, everything you see is a nail. Hence, at the expense of our real security, including spending to reverse the existential crisis of the climate emergency and the need for social spending, the Pentagon budget is more than half of the discretionary government spending and is determinative in U.S. foreign policy formation. You can be sure that the current debt crisis and budgetary deals uh, are such that the gargantuan military budget is more likely to be increased than cut. It is in these contexts that we are confronted by new Cold Wars with Russia and China, including the disastrous Ukraine war. To give you a better idea of what I'll be saying this afternoon, my talk will be in three parts. I'll begin with information and analysis that may be familiar to you. I'll turn then to a chilling report about how absolutely dangerous the Ukraine and new Cold Wars have become. And I'll close with suggestions about possible actions that we can take to stop the killing in Ukraine and to build a common security future that can prevent the existential cataclysms of nuclear war and climate emergency. First, the Ukraine war is about much more than Ukraine. It is not simply a criminal Russian war of aggression, which it is, but as the recent U.S. national security strategy informs us, quote, the post-Cold War era is definitely over and competition is underway between the major powers to shape what comes next. It's a new period, not unlike, say, the period of 1946 to 52 and the creation of that Cold War. The war and its devastations and its nuclear threats, its environmental and climate fallout, are major elements of the collapse of the bipolar world disorder, the idea of the U.S. and, 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 and uh, Soviet Union. Uh, it's also a period of the birthing of a new multipolar order, and the, and the resulting global competition for power and privilege. The world is in the midst of major historic changes. The Ukraine war is not unrelated to the intensifying military and economic tensions with China, as China is eager to keep the United States and NATO uh, as occupied as possible in Europe in order to reduce their growing military pressure on Beijing. I mean, the United States has literally hundreds of military bases along uh, uh, encircling China, uh, and the Seventh Fleet has, uh, well, I'll say something more about the Seventh Fleet in a minute. Uh, the, the new Cold Wars are classic reincarnations of the Thucydides trap, the inevitable tensions between rising and declining powers, uh, 
which over history have too often climaxed in catastrophic wars, twice in the 20th century. Such a climax is not inevitable, and with forces that uh, led to the end of the Cold War, it can be prevented by our social movement's pressure from below and by common security diplomacy, the visions and elements of which we must all play a role in creating. It's no secret that the U.S. near-term priority in Ukraine is not simply to block Russian aggression, but to weaken Russia for the longer term. In Europe, Asia, and the Global South, the Biden administration is working to reinforce the four-generation-old Bretton Woods NATO systems established in the first years of the Cold War. Resisting what it perceives to be Russia's immediate and China's longer-term threats to the so-called rules-based order, uh, doing so is a, is a losing proposition uh, in our increasingly multipolar, multipolar world. Creative adaption would be a wiser and more life-affirming strategy. Uh, yes, a, a just rules-based order is something that we should aspire to. But we also need to remember that Russia is not the only gross violator of international law. Recall our country's wars to maintain and expand its empires, including the Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq invasions, Washington's support for Israeli apartheid, and the history of U.S. subversion of more than a few countries around the world. Unlike Trump, the Biden administration understands that the U.S. cannot enforce its hegemony unilaterally. Thus, it gives high priority to integrating its allies' military, economic, and technological powers to resist China's long-term and China's near-term challenges to U.S. primacy. So much for democracy over autocracy. India's brutal Prime Minister Modi will be welcomed at the White House next month for a state, a state visit, right? And think in terms of the other state visits we've had, France and, uh, and, and South Korea, uh, all part of the process of building uh, the alliance and consolidating the alliance relationships. Uh, amidst Russian and Ukrainian offensives and counteroffensives, we face the danger of horizontal or vertical proliferation, which is to say expanding more widely into Europe uh, or moving up the technological change to, to, to nuclear use of nuclear weapons. Uh, miscalculations could bring NATO forces more directly into the war or lead Russia to resort to nuclear weapons if its leaders believe the existence of the Russian state is in jeopardy. Uh, Putin has already said the existence of the Russian state is in jeopardy. In the Baltic and the Black Seas, uh, as well as provocative shows of force near Taiwan and the South China Sea, an accident, an incident, or a miscalculation could trigger escalation even to nuclear confrontation and war. I mean, it's a dangerous time, friends. Uh, what lay behind Putin's disastrous decision to invade Ukraine? Almost always, more than a single factor precipitates a, a war. In the Russian case, the invasion was designed first to offset increasing uh, Russian strategic vulnerabilities resulting from NATO's expansion to its borders. That's the large subject of the full-page ad in the New York Times this last week. Uh, secondly, it was to pursue Russia's historic uh, imperial ambitions. Uh, quite remarkably, in, uh, in February, before the invasion, February 2022, uh, Putin gave this speech in which he uh, basically sided with Stalin against Lenin uh, in terms of, of the approach to, to nationalities uh, and imperialism. But the third was to reinforce uh, the standing of Moscow's ruling elite. There's a really wonderful progressive uh, Russian uh, figure, a uh, guy who's been arrested by every, every, uh, uh, every, every regime uh, in Russia going back to like the 70s, Boris Kargolitsky, who has written and, and spoken very, very, very well about the, the, the use of this war to uh, consolidate Putin's power. But as we know, not all has gone well for Putin or the Ukrainian or Russian peoples, not to mention the worldwide economic and foods insecurity. Ominously, the Euro-Atlantic common security architecture, about which people don't know much in the United States, which began in the 1990s with the Paris Charter, has collapsed. Uh, so too, uh, beginning with W. Bush's withdrawal from the anti-ballistic missile treaty 20 years ago. I mean, it's amazing. You will remember 20 years ago, the big fight over withdrawing from that. That, that removed the central pillar of the global arms control um, uh, order. Uh, but now with, with the invasions and with Trump having withdrawn from the INF Treaty, uh, the limited but hard-won uh, arms control system has been shattered, opening the way for unrestrained and very dangerous arms races. Get some water here. 
The Biden administration's national security strategy is clear about its primary commitments. They have made the Ukraine war their own and NATO's, but their first priority is to contain and outcompete China, which is seen as quote unquote a peer competitor, believed to be the greatest challenge to US hegemony. Secondly, the strategy aims at containing Russia. The strategy updates Obama's pivot to Asia and Trump's protectionist trade policies while insisting that the U.S. maintain its unmatched military, including nuclear, AI, and space warfighting capabilities. For the near term, the Biden administration warns that, quote, Russia now poses an immediate and persistent threat to international peace and stability. Yes, Putin does, repair, does bear principal responsibility for the Ukraine war, but as this past Tuesday's full-page advertisement in the New York Times, signed by former senior military, diplomatic, and intelligence figures, tells us, with NATO's expansion and the history of U.S. imperial wars, there is significant or sufficient uh, moral ambiguity to go around, and diplomacy is what is needed now. Few in the United States were even aware of the 1990s Euro-American Common Security Commitments, the Paris Charter, the NATO-Russia Founding Framework, and the 1999 OSCE Memorandum. They enshrined the commitment that no nation would seek to augment its security at the expense of another. That was a commitment first shattered by my classmate, Bill Clinton, uh, when he began a NATO expansion. In the Indo-Pacific, uh, we were dealing with a struggle for regional hegemony that dates to the beginning of the U.S. empire with 1898 conquests of the island nation stepping stones to the China market, which then as now was seen as the holy grail of capitalism. Uh, I learned that phrase, holy grail of capitalism, from uh, one of my professors who was the primary ghostwriter for Kennedy's Profiles in Courage. Uh, the Philippines, Guam, and Samoa were conquered and Hawaii annexed. The Pacific Theater in World War II, and this is not part of what we learned in school, that theater was a war between competing empires, a bit different from, from the European theater. Japan, the, the empires were Japan, Britain, and the U.S. And with the U.S. victory, the Pacific became an American lake dominated by the Seventh Fleet and reinforced by hundreds of U.S. military bases and installations which extend from South Korea through Japan and the Philippines down to Australia, as well as by repeated U.S. nuclear threats to attack the Soviet Union, China, and North Korea. What Putin is doing now is something that the United States has done repeatedly. As Dan Ellsberg says, uh, during international crises and wars, the U.S. has repeatedly prepared and threatened to initiate nuclear war. We can say more about that in Q&A if I've piqued your interest or challenged your, your, your thinking there. Given today's Russian-Chinese strategic interdependence, China has considerable skin in the Ukraine war, along with its need to retain access to European markets. Even as Xi and the Chinese leadership call for a ceasefire in negotiations, they are working to ensure that Washington and NATO will need to continue concentrating major military and economic resources in Europe. They're doing this in order to reinsure, rather to reduce the um, intensity of their Indo-Pacific military buildup uh, and commitments to contain China's rise. With what will, long be it, with what will be its long-term economic and strategic dependence on China, Russia's options for independent action will be increasingly limited. Russia is not going to become a colony of um, of China, uh, but certainly it's going to be increasingly dependent on China, and, and as I said, have a great, much greater limited freedom of action. The national security strategy gives pride of place to the China threat, which may, many see as inflated. Uh, it was described as, quote, the decisive decade. China is named as, quote, the, am I see if I'm the right one here, is, is the only competitor with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to do it. And you know, the example I gave of China and, and Brazil uh, is a way of, of understanding some of what's going on. China's military modernization, including its South China micro island bases, are the, quote, pacing threat that drives the U.S. military planning, spending, and operations. The strategy goes on to assert that Beijing uses, quote, its technological capacity and diplomatic influence to mold global technology use and norms to privilege its interests and values. Well, as I read that in the strategy, I thought this is what the United States has been doing for the last 75 years. Uh, they're just using what they've got to increase their influence. Uh, 
Even as the strategy recognizes U.S.-Chinese economic independence and cites China's central role in climate and public health issues, the strategy provides for a two-part U.S. containment strategy. On the one hand, uh, massive investments to revitalize the U.S. economy and technological innovation as the foundation of U.S. power, and on the other, deepening alignment with U.S. allies and partners. Biden went a long way toward fulfilling the strategy's first commitments with a $560 billion boost to the U.S. economy, which was reinforced by an additional $52 billion subsidy to the U.S. semiconductor and high-tech industries. And I've just been sort of watching what's happening with the Republican um, insistence on cutting the budget uh, in the, um, around the debt, the debt crisis here. And, you know, just thinking that, you know, on the one hand, they hate China, the, 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 you know, the rhetoric and the discourse in Washington is, you know, almost 100% anti-China, led by just absolute war hawks from the Republican Party. And on the other hand, if they cut these budgets, they weaken at least the, the, the foundations of U.S. economic and, and uh, technological strength. And to reinforce U.S. Uh, Asia-Pacific hegemony, Biden and company have consolidated the Quad Military Alliance with Japan, Australia, and India, which the debt crisis has undermined a little bit. Uh, we have the Nuclear AUKUS Alliance, the United States, UK, and, and, uh, and the US uh, being deepened, while South Korea and Japan have been encouraged to paper over profound historic enmities, uh, despite deep popular South Korean resistance. So we can talk about that uh, more. The US has been moving to try to consolidate a tripartite U.S.-Japanese-South uh, Korean alliance. And as we saw with the White House welcome of Manila's new president, a second uh, Marcos dictatorship, has re-embraced the U.S. military alliance. NATO's new strategic concept named China's containment as a NATO alliance priority. NATO is now operative in the Pacific. Uh, it's m increasing numbers of the European uh, naval operations are joining joint uh, operations with the United States. And of course, if you look at it from an Asian perspective, uh, you know, they're seeing kind of a continuation of European colonialism and neocolonialism. All of these nations, uh, meaning the U.S. allies nations, uh, militaries are being made more interoperative. Uh, and it was no accident that the G7 uh, summit uh, is focused on containing China and, and Russia. Then we come to Taiwan, uh, the hinge and most dangerous potential flashpoint of this dangerous geopolitical competition. After decades of ambiguity, and as we saw when Taiwan's ostensible ambassador to Washington was invited to participate in Biden's inauguration, Democrats and, and Republicans in Washington are united in their drive to bring Taiwan fully into the U.S. sphere. For China, reunification of what Beijing perceives as a strategically critical and rogue province, which was first severed by the mainland in 1895 by Japan, and then served as a U.S. protectorate since 1949, is a national priority, which from the Chinese perspective is needed to complete the Chinese Civil War. And it's the final prize also seen as necessary to overcome the century and a half of humiliation. Parenthetically, the, area of, the era of humiliation began with the Opium War, fought by Britain, and covertly supported by the United States to ensure Britain's ability to addict millions of Chinese and thus stanch London's massive balance of payments problem resulting from Britain's addiction to tea. Worth noting is that a number of U.S. old money fortunes like the Vanderbilts, the Cabots, the Cushings, the Delanos, and the Perkins were built in significant measure from the opium trade. The British had the high quality opium from India and the Americans dealt with opium from Turkey. For now, I'm sorry, for the U.S. and now Japan, China is needed to bottle up China's navy, and it's a democratic society not to be sacrificed to Chinese authoritarianism. Although the Biden administration has reiterated its commitment to the One China policy, its actions, including removing One China language from the State Department's webpage, its sending of warships into the Taiwan Strait, its massive arms sales to Taiwan, Nancy Pelosi's delegation to Taiwan, and Speaker McCarthy's recent meeting with Taiwan's president tells a different story, the undermining of the one China policy.
Then let me turn, if I haven't done enough for you, um, let, me, let me turn to some more chilling uh, dynamics. For the past year and a half, I have unexpectedly been the one U.S. peace movement leader invited to listen in on confidential track two discussions involving current and former senior European, Russian, and U.S. governmental advisors, military officials, and diplomats. Uh, in the tradition of Sesame Street, you know, they had this little thing of which one of these things is not like the other. That's me in these sessions. Uh, but I've learned a lot. Uh, these are people who help to shape and implement their government's policies. Over the years, some have engaged in negotiations with one another. Within their countries, most are seen as patriots, even as we might see some of them as partly responsible or apologists for policies we condemn. While deeply committed to what they perceive as their respective government's interests, they are committed to preventing an apocalyptic U.S.-NATO versus Russia nuclear war. These discussions have gone through three phases. Uh, first, seeking diplomatic ways to prevent Russian invasion of Ukraine. Then they focused on the urgent dangers resulting from the collapse of the six decades old arms control architecture and how, secure, and how security stability uh, could be restored after the war. More recently, they have focused on the consequences and dangers of Russia's self-inflicted Ukrainian strategic disaster. And this includes the instability growing from NATO's expansion and its massive conventional military superiority. I mean, NATO is overwhelmingly conventionally more powerful uh, than, than Russia. I'm, I'm prohibited from quoting or making individual attributions, but I can summarize elements of the recent dis uh, discussions. Uh, as I said earlier, this is a very dangerous time. So first, we face the possibility of an indeterminately long Ukrainian war of attrition. Zelensky's insistence on conceding not one centimeter of what was Ukrainian territory in 1991 and his goal of shattering the Russian military with his spring offensive is matched by Russia's refusal to accept defeat. Ukraine's uh, coming offensive contains enormous risks all around. If Kiev fails to make significant gains, it could lead to reductions in U.S. and NATO endless commitments uh, to Ukraine. If Ukraine succeeds and threatens to take Crimea, which has been Russia's warm water port since 1853, when was it that we annexed uh, Hawaii? Uh, how long has uh, uh, Alaska been part of the United States? Uh, but if, if, if Crimea is threatened, odds are that Putin will result, resort to launching tactical nuclear weapons, and that, that, that danger will increase exponentially. If there's a ray of hope in all of this, it is that a stalemate or increasing danger of nuclear war could finally open the way for an armistice or peace negotiations. Second, Russians observe that as a consequence of the war, Moscow has not been so isolated since the 1850s, when it was at war with, a uni with unified Western allies and Turkey uh, in the Crimean War, or face them rather, uh, and faced threats from the British fleet across the Bal Baltic Sea. Even after drawing its forces from the Russian Far East and the Kola Peninsula, Moscow has not established conventional military supremacy over Ukraine. Given Russia's larger population and industrial base, in time that, that superiority may come. Moscow also sees NATO deployments in Poland as a real, not a theoretical, uh, threat. And more about that in a moment. And for Russia's de-escalation, for Russians, the de-escalation means defeat. These realities, plus NATO's expansion, have crystallized Russia's increasing dependency on its nuclear arsenal, both tactical and strategic, chilling reality. Uh, yet yesterday, uh, Martha and, and John uh, tuned into a, a webinar that we did uh, with uh, experts from uh, Russia and the United States on nuclear power plants. We very consciously did not discuss the Ukraine war. And when it was over, um, some of us were, were, were talking, and there's a really courageous uh, uh, Russian physicist I've been working with who's one of the speakers, and he expresses deep appreciation for, for the webinar, saying that in, in Russia they are at this point so isolated that being able to engage with people from the West is just a real, real gift to them. Third, uh, there's reference, do I have this right here? One more. I haven't, been, I haven't been moving it. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, third, there was reference to the uh, line of contact, which is something I associate with the Indian-Pakistani military and nuclear confrontation. Uh, 
During the Cold War, the Ukrainian line of contact was the Foldy Gap in Germany. While it will not be solidified until the end of the Ukraine war, the line now extends along Russia's western border from Eastern Europe to the Baltics and the eastern frontiers of Scandinavia. This is not a recipe for demilitarization or reduced military spending. This is the line of contact for the new Cold War. In July, the NATO, NATO summit will be held in Vilnius, and it will be probably among the most important uh, in the alliance's history. It will focus on decisions designed to contain Russia and China and increasing NATO's military strength, especially in Eastern Europe and the Baltics. The alliance is expected to quadruple its forces along the, this, the front that you just saw, um, with four to 5,000 permanently deployed uh, NATO forces in each of these nations. You know, with, with the um, ex expansion, say, into Poland and Lithuania, the Baltics, it's been on a rotating basis, not permanently, but now they'll be permanently based. Uh, there will be continued planning for possible use of NATO's nuclear arsenal, including the new B-6112H bombs being deployed in six NATO nations. As we speak now, uh, in Britain, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament has uh, organized a major demonstration at Lake and Heath, uh, where they're bringing U.S. nuclear weapons back to, back to Britain. The obligation will be to, to, to spend at least 2% or more of each NATO nation's uh, GDP for the military will be reinforced. Just to understand it, the United States currently spends 4%, a uh, massive increase in military spending all around. It's worth remembering that U.S. military spending is already 12 times more than Russia's and three times China's. European NATO members are already deeply involved, as I said, in joint military exercises in Taiwanese and South China Sea waters. These commitments will be increased as the ostensibly North Atlantic, uh, now global military alliance, uh, deepens its role in containing China militarily. Uh, and even as um, Macron, Schultz, and several other European leaders are anxious not to lose market share in China, um, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of pulling in, in two different directions here. Over the longer term, NATO plans to build up Ukraine's military, making it interoperable with NATO forces. This was a process that was already underway uh, before the, the, uh, Ukrainian, uh, the Russian invasion. U.S. Track 2 speakers and at least one well-placed European spoke of the likelihood of Ukraine becoming a NATO member within five years. They argued that after the war, NATO membership could prevent Ukraine from taking aggressive military actions against Russia and that an Article 5 NATO guarantee would be cheaper than providing Ukraine with an endless supply of weapons. With or without NATO membership, there is the possibility of Washington adopting a new law analogous to the Taiwan Relations Act, but this time for Ukraine, committing the U.S. to defend Ukraine. Europeans respond that their countries would block NATO membership and that moving toward a Ukrainian membership would create a crisis within NATO. Russians, meanwhile, fear that the Ukrainian tail would wag the U.S. NATO dog and that Ukrainian NATO membership would mean a U.S. NATO war with, with Russia, which would likely go nuclear. Expectations are that following Turkey's election, and now we're into the second round here, I guess in two weeks, uh, and lubricated by promises of more advanced U.S. weapons and passage of a Swedish anti-terrorism law uh, designed to placate Turkey, that Sweden could become an alliance member in time to join the summit in Vilnius. Almost finally here. Um, with Finland's accession to NATO, alliance forces are now 93 miles from St. Petersburg. Think about that. 93 miles. The Baltic Sea is now seen as a NATO lake, and this builds pressure on, U on Russian nuclear arms Kaliningrad, which Poland has just provocatively rechristened and I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, Krolowicz, the district's name when it was ruled from Warsaw in the 15th and 16th centuries. So deepening, deepening tensions. This is the increased military pressure, this, this and the increased military pressure on continental Russia will result in Moscow building up its forces in northwest Russia. Moscow could also respond by making Moldova and Georgia increasingly dangerous flashpoints. Regardless of the outcome of the Ukraine war, we're in for a long and dangerous Cold War. Finally, even with its strong military, given Finland's size and small population, 
NATO will need to spend much, much more for its defense. And it's an open question whether Europeans or even Americans will be willing to make this sacrifice. So having laid out this beautiful um, uh, landscape that we, we face here, uh, what then might be done? Uh, our work is absolutely cut out for us, that's clear. Uh, adding to our challenges is that in addition to Biden, Blinken, and Austin being determined to use the war to weaken Russia, there's also the legacy of Afghanistan. They hesitate to make a deal with Moscow over Zelensky's head, much as Trump did with the Taliban and what we know followed from that. Fortunately, it appears that the Pope, President Xi and Lula, and their partners may be filling this gap. That said, as Tuesday's New York Times ad urges, our most, our most urgent priority must be pressing our governments for a ceasefire and negotiations to stop the killing and to end the Ukraine war on as just a basis as possible before it escalates further. Toward this end, the International Peace Bureau, Code Pink, the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, Common Security, and other organizations are organizing a global civil society peace summit in Vienna in June. Its international conference will be online, followed by a march, meetings uh, with embassy officials, and a declaration, all pressing for ceasefire and negotiations. In the run-up to the peace summit, the U.S. and I think I need to be on a different. Um, in the run-up to the peace summit, uh, uh, the U.S. And, uh, the U.S. Peace in Ukraine Coalition, and now I think a hundred organizations, have launched a signature campaign, which will climax on May 24th with the publication in the Hill of our statement urging Presidents Biden, Putin, and Zelensky to end the war. And there's copies of it in the New York Times ad uh, here on the table. Then, as either part of trust building that encourages negotiations to end the war, or when the guns fall silent, it will be imperative to revive the 1980s concept of common security, which served as the foundation for the uh, INF, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, that sealed the end of the Cold War before the collapse of the Berlin Wall. 1987, uh, as opposed to 1989. Um, where am I here? Um, yeah, common security uh, went on to serve as the foundation of the European security architecture in the 1990s, including the Paris Charter, the NATO-Russia Founding Act, and the 1999 uh, OSCE Memorandum. The 1982 Common Security Report, led by Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme, with deep engagements by European, U.S., and Soviet national security elites, defanged the then spiraling and extremely dangerous U.S.-Soviet nuclear arms race with the recognition of an ancient truth. Quoting, Security cannot be obtained unilaterally, economically, politically, culturally, and imp uh, importantly, militarily. We live in an independent world, uh, and no nation can achieve its security at the expense of another. This is where we're living now. Um, this is the way out of the, of the crises we face. Just to say, uh, I have a peculiar reading habit. Uh, and so I read a book by Georgi Arbatov, who was the kind of leading um, uh, military advisor to Gorbachev and, 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 and Soviet leaders before that. And, and in conversation with Cyrus Vance, who was then the, you know, the, the former U.S. Secretary of State, uh, Arbitov was led to understand uh, that, that the arms race really was not the way to, to secure Russian security. Uh, and, 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 and out of those discussions, uh, we, we got the common security arrangements and the INF, the INF treaty. Uh, where am I here? Um, yeah, massive disarmament demonstrations of millions of people in Europe and the US and around the world created the environment in which leading national security advisors uh, finally engaged in thoughtful discussions about the sources of their nations and so on and so forth. Common security is not uh, sweet hugs and kisses, uh, nor is it uh, all that our peace movements demand. But it is essential if we are to diffuse the spectacularly dangerous great power tensions that bring us to the brink of nuclear and climate annihilation. I mean, we need to understand uh, how close we are to nuclear and climate annihilation. Um, this, is, this, is, this is what humans have done. Uh, but it's essential if we're to, to, to do that. At its core, it involves hard-headed diplomatic negotiations, identifying and then reversing the ostensibly defensive military buildups 
that lead rivals to respond in kind, and you end up with the spiraling arms race. In the 1980s, that meant foregoing the deployment of Soviet SS missiles that could destroy Europe and the deployment of U.S. Pershing and cruise missiles that could decapitate Soviet leadership in eight minutes. Today, common security negotiations could begin with guarantees of Ukrainian sovereignty and neutrality, along with major Russian withdrawals from the borderland nation. Looking back, although it in no way excuses Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine, tragically, stupidly, President Clinton and his successors lost sight of the essential common security truth. With Cold War thinking and little regard for Russia's defining history of invasions from the West, think here in terms of Napoleon, Kaiser, and Hitler, they launched the 30-year campaign of NATO expansion that has brought U.S. and NATO forces to Russia's border and was a spur for Putin's ill-considered invasion of Ukraine. The end is in sight, friends. Uh, just over a year ago, an alliance of the Olaf Palmaces, I'm going ahead of myself. Um, just over a year ago, an alliance of the Olaf Palma Center in Sweden, the International Peace Bureau in Berlin, and the International Trade Union Confederation, along with partners, developed their Common Security 22, 2022 report. The project steering committee was augmented by a committee of former diplomats, political leaders, UN officials, and scholars from across Europe, Russia, China, uh, the U.S. and the Global South. And this is a picture actually from just earlier this week. Fortunately, building on track two and other dialogues, we have begun to identify mutually beneficial common security openings. Now addressing both the Euro-Atlantic, inclusive of Russia, and the U.S. Uh, East Asia military, economic, and political confrontations. Uh, IPB, CPDCS uh, in the U.S., Peace Mobile in South Korea, and partners have launched a new common security project. Uh, we didn't all smile during the whole thing, but this was, this, this was a late picture. So what might we recommend? A little bit early to, to say yet, but obviously peace negotiations leading to a ceasefire in Ukraine, recognizing Ukraine as sovereign and neutral nation with major withdrawals of Russian troops. Resumption of US, NATO, and Russia and uh, China military to military communications. Uh, peace movement doesn't usually talk about military to military discourse, communication. But if you've got a crisis going from uh, you know, some, some junior officer on a Chinese ship launches a rocket at a US ship, uh, we need to have leaders of both militaries talking with one another to prevent it from, from escalating. Uh, it could include a neutral European nation uh, initiating the, uh, in, an Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe conference in 2025. OSCE grew out of the Helsinki process. It was basically the foundation of detente uh, and, uh, and, and, and the, and the uh, security order in Europe that prevailed until we began taking it apart. And it can only be brought together by a neutral nation, which now means uh, Ireland or Austria, Switzerland will do it. But this is one way in which we can begin recreating a stable environment in, in Europe and with Russia. Uh, it could include nuclear weapons-free zones in Central and Eastern Europe, inclusive of Western Russia, and multilateral negotiations for Northeast Asian nuclear weapons-free zone. It can include major reductions in military spending, or no first-use doctrines by all nuclear weapon states. It can include reinstatement of previous arms control agreements and negotiation of new multilateral uh, disarmament agree agreements, including, say, China. Uh, and limitations on AI high and high-tech weaponry. It can include development of new and credible paradigm to replace the one country, two systems um, model uh, that was used for the um, integration of, of Hong Kong. Uh, you know, that agreement was not fully implemented. Uh, and so there's a recognition that if Taiwan is going to uh, be willing to move toward reunification, it has to have guarantees of the, of the continuing existence of its democratic culture and political system. And as we saw yesterday, uh, the uh, importance of people-to-people -people exchanges. Let me close then uh, with a quotation from UN, former UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon to a major international peace conference on the eve of the 2020 uh, MPT Review Conference in New York. Gov whoops, we not where we want to be here. Governments, he said, will not deliver us peace or disarmament. That can only come, he said, with pressure from below.
whether it is winning a ceasefire in negotiations for Ukraine, preventing great power wars, eliminating nuclear weapons, or truly addressing the climate crisis, it is up to us and our movements to build that pressure from below, which is essential if our governments are to provide us with real security. And if we believe that stopping and preventing disastrous wars, building a just society, saving future generations from climate catastrophe, if we believe they are the most important things we can do, then we need to live our lives accordingly. Thank you for your attention. I've gone on a bit long, uh, but um, um, I hope you found it helpful.